Welcome to Lydia Finette's Claim Your Confidence, a podcast that will introduce you to the most powerful women in the world as they talk about their own confidence journey. No matter what obstacles you face, Claim Your Confidence will inspire you, motivate you, and give you a roadmap to live the life you want. So, are you ready to claim your confidence? Welcome, everybody. I'm Lydia Finette, and this is Claim Your Confidence. We're here in Rockefeller Center on another beautiful summer day. I feel like I've said this so many times, but this is one without humidity. I can't even tell you how delighted I am to be sitting across from Mallory Irvin, who is here with me today. And I want to tell you a story before we launch into the question. So I was asked to speak on a panel in Nashville, and I went down to Nashville, and I was looking up the women who were on the panel, and I came across the bio of this incredible woman who'd been Miss Kentucky in 2009, had been on The Amazing Race three times, and had just written a best-selling book. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I've got to meet her. I walk in, ball of energy, beautiful, sunny smile, the kindest, warmest woman. We spent the evening chatting, and I took her book. The next day, I got on the airplane. My flight was delayed for five hours. And I remember thinking, well, this is great because I have this book, and I pull it out, And I open it up and I start the story of her life. And wow, she has been through some stuff. There have been confidence highs and lows, and I couldn't get her on my podcast fast enough. Welcome to Claim Your Confidence, Mallory. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. If this is not just a New York moment for me, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) we've made this a fun trip with my husband and I, but I mean, it is so amazing, like looking out Rockefeller Plaza. I would expect nothing less of you, though, Lydia. Like, (laughs) this is exactly what I'd expect. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Oh, I am so thrilled that you're here. And I'm so thrilled that you've come in such colorful sort of garb, as I would expect. (laughs) I also look like, as I said to someone, I'm brightly covered tablecloth today. But I felt like it was all Southern, and I knew you'd be Mm -hmm. here in something great. So thank you for being here. I'm so excited. So I want to dive in, because as I said, as we were beginning this off, there are so many incredible lessons to learn from you about confidence. But I want to know... Who was Mallory growing up in Kentucky on a farm? Tell me about a young Mallory. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So we, it's so funny, like, you know, nowadays, like, being on a homestead or a compound is kind of, like, cool and hip. But, like, (laughs) I grew up, yes, in western Kentucky. My grandparents lived in the middle of our property, and then all of my dad's siblings lived around it. So we had acres of, you know, vegetable gardens, and we had Belgian horses, and we had four-wheelers. We'd ride back and forth to, you know, each other's houses. It was a really amazing way to grow up but it I mean we were country fresh yeah like country kids my grandpa had this old like country grocery store and pawn shop and liquor store and we'd all work there at like eight years old we'd be like stocking cigarette shelves and (laughs) illegally stocking (laughs) liquor cabinets you know back in the day um and it was just this amazing way to grow up and I was a little bit different than a lot of people in my hometown. I was a singer. So, you know, from the time that I was really young, like six, I was performing on stage. And Was that from church? Where did you learn to? No, you know, I just kind of came out singing. My mom <laughs> said I was singing my ABCs like before two. Oh, um, wow. And it was just something I loved to do. A couple people in my family sang, but not really. I don't have a musical family. And, you know, you're from a southern town, too. Mm. When you have a talent or like something special in a small town, it is the most amazing thing because that town is so proud of you and yes, they lift you so up true. There's and a they ask you to sing. <laughs> yes, the signs when you come into my the county, you know, still the home of me. Oh, you know, it's um, that's amazing. every wedding and funeral and festival. And, you know, I started emceeing and singing and, um, and they how allowed old were you me when you were that star. young? At I was six? six, five or six, when I started performing on stage, and you just loved it. I loved it, mm-hmm. and you know, in a small town, they don't have many participants, so I would be competing against the people that were forty-five seasoned singers in the talent shows, and the five-year-old would win, and yes. you know, this t- they were like, okay, really, like, come on, <laughs> but it was really special, and you know, for most of my childhood, it. It was amazing. It it made me who I was. My family was so proud of me. I was the oldest of all these cousins that lived on this farm, 23 first cousins. And it was really special. It was really, it was magic growing up, like in Western Kentucky. And this, it was like a bubble. But then um, just being so lifted up by my family and my community, I feel like, like, claim your confidence. Everything that you do is about confidence. Like, it gave me confidence. I had automatic confidence when I was younger. And it was amazing. And so when did the stages start getting bigger then? 
pretty quick. So uh, when I was 10 or 11, I was asked to sing the national anthem at an NBA playoff like Final Four game. Oh, wow. And I mean, you know, the national anthem is no music. Yeah. It's a really hard song to sing. It's yeah. like one end of your range to the next. And I feel like I got on big stages before I knew to be nervous mm -hmm. about a big stage. I mean, I was a kid. I didn't have on any makeup. Like, my aunt had come and curled my hair and, like, banana curls. <laughs> I had a bow in my hair. And You're like, could those pictures please be deleted? I know, for real. <laughs> and I can just remember walking out onto those larger stages as this little child. And, you know, I have a five-year-old now, so I think— a few years from now, would you walk up in front of 34,000 people? Like, you could hear a pin drop for yeah. the national anthem. Charles Barkley, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Karl Malone, and, like, all of these, you know. I was starstruck because they were on Space Jam. <laughs> and I, um, you know, it was just really cool. And it was really awesome, too, that my parents really just went with it. Yeah. They would never let me leave my normal life and school, you know, things like that to, like, actually pursue music full-time and like move to Nashville it wasn't like a Taylor Swift thing where they were like let's all move the family to here Los Angeles we for go your dream I know. <laughs> you know it was like well this is awesome that you do this and we'll fly all over the country and do it and we can make CDs and all these things but like you're also going to be a kid yeah. and I think that that was the most special combination of things that like made me the person that I was because I was doing these amazing big things, but I also grew up in this tiny town where morals and ideals and authenticity is really something that shines because everybody knows everybody mm -hmm. and you've got to act right. Yeah. And so it was just this really amazing way to grow up and the stages got bigger fast and then they kept getting bigger and bigger and I opened for country music bands in the summer, like between schools and I made CDs and I went back and forth to Nashville with my grandparents every week from the time I was 11 years old. They would take me after school on Wednesdays. And it was so special too, like getting to spend time with them. You know, one of 23 cousins, you don't get one-on-one -on -one time with your grandparents. Yeah. And I learned so many life lessons about this, this generation that like still today, my grandparents are still living. Some of the things that are like the lighthouses in my life even today. So yeah, big stages, um, big responsibility I felt you know as a young kid because you were owning the town and you were in charge of being Mallory Irvin which charge. I'm sure at a very early age <laughs> yes. became a persona yeah. now I definitely remember in Lake Charles that there were people like that you know I can think of a number of them actually who over the years everybody would talk about them mm -hmm. with such reverence mm -hmm. and you know it's like oh Lake Charles you know who came here and he won an Academy Award or he won an Oscar or all yeah. of these incredible things and I know what that's like as someone when you were watching it happen to mm -hmm. someone because it's true the town mm -hmm. really lifts you up so I can yeah. imagine in an even smaller town that that would have been something to behold mm -hmm. famous in a small town that Miranda Lambert song that like I love it it's just so true <laughs> famous you listen in a to small it you're town. like I know this, this I know this life. I lived it yes <laughs> So you left to go to Swanee, which mm. in full disclosure is the college that we both went to that we realized yes. when we were on the panel, which again is a small Southern school. Yes. How did you How did you fit in? Did you like it? Did you like being there? I did. You know, I, um, and that was so funny how we found that out. You know, I think that someone came to the book signing line and was like, I went to Swanee too. And we both at the same time were like, me too. Like, you went to Swanee? I don't know why you don't expect like people to go to Swanee. Well, probably because there's 1,400 kids in the whole entire school. Right. That's why. You never meet people. People that go to Swanee. I know. You know Except the people that like you that. went with that you're probably still yes. friends with. In Nashville, like, there's, a, there's a big Swanee community. Yes. But I did not expect, you know, you. Someone this, living in New York yes, City to have to gone to Swanee. Swanee person. <laughs> so I ended at that, up at that school in a kind of a funny way. I, um, I visited Stanford. I visited Yale. I visited um, Belmont. I visited Miami of Ohio. And at the end of the day, for some reason, I chose to go to Miami of Ohio. We had done orientation. I'd bought my refrigerator, matching bedspreads with my <laughs> roommate. This really got takes me card. back. Matching bedspreads, of course. I know, because you got to match the <laughs> dorm. Course. It's important. This is a very Southern thing, by the way. I'm not it sure is. that this is also in the... I, I remember going from Taft back down to Swanee. Yes. And my roommate's mother was like, are you going to get matching sunflower bedspreads? I'm really <laughs> dating myself because sunflowers were a big thing when I was they're growing big, up. They're big again. My Taft roommates and I had never matched anything. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I mean, I guess. Uh -huh, okay. okay. And I was like, yeah, oh, that's right. I'm going back down to the South. Mm -hmm. Everything has to match and there should be a floral theme, of yes. course. Yes, <laughs> a floral theme, of course. So... You know, Miami of Ohio is in Ohio. Swanee, of course, is in Tennessee. And I grew up in Kentucky. And we just had such an affinity for 
the South. I had never really like even traveled to many of like the Northern states. And I don't know why, but my dad really was being drawn to me going to Swanee. He's not like a domineering, controlling, I make decisions in this family man Mm -hmm. at all. And it was the only time he's ever done this in my entire life. And I think it was like a God thing, honestly, because it was where I was meant to go to school. Mm -hmm. And it was the night before I was supposed to leave to go to Mammy of Ohio. And um, he said, I've already paid your tuition at Swanee, and that's where you're going to school. <laughs> okay, well, I guess could I'm not. Going. I mean, which I'm really grateful that my parents paid tuition for me. You know, that's a, a gift. But I, at the time, I was really mad. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Perspective I'm is different, all, right? Yes. I was like, I'm packing up all of my stuff and going to like beauty school after this. Like, you know, because I liked doing like beauty things too. You know, I was so mad. And I was there for like three days. I don't know. He saw something that I didn't see in that mm. school. And I, I think also it was so like rural feeling. And I'd grown up rural, so I wouldn't go big city, Oxford, yeah. Ohio, you yeah. know. And it was the right decision. And I really believe that a lot of the direction of my life was shaped by those years at Swanee and the people that I met. And I'm really I'm really glad I always laugh and say it was like the best decision I never made because <laughs> I didn't make it. He made it. And so that's how I ended up there. And I always thought like I, I would go and I, or I thought I would go and be so mad and just leave after the first semester. And I loved it. Yeah, I felt the same way. I really loved it. It was a really special place. It is so special. And I walked away with so many close friends to this day. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had 13 bridesmaids. I think about seven or eight of them were from Swanee. And everyone yeah. in the Northeast and from New York had come down. I married someone from New York. And they all came down to New Orleans for the wedding, we had this big Southern wedding. And I remember so many people were laughing because the night of the rehearsal dinner, half of the bridesmaids were all dressed in black reading from their iPhones. And those were my New York friends. And my <laughs> Southern friends were in, you know, every color of the rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> and all these, all the moms of um, my husband's friends' parents were all just laughing. And they're like, Where, what is this school that produces these lovely young ladies? Yes, because they so, remember like the dress code at Swanee. Yeah. I mean, skirts women, and dresses to skirts class. Skirts and dresses to I know, class. I know. And then you've got the funny, like the gowns. I'm sure you are gownsmen too. Like yeah. when you get a certain GPA or something, you know, you get to join the order of the gownsmen. So then you put this black, long Harry Potter looking robe over your, your Lily dress. Pulitzer dress. I know, it's so true. It is such <laughs> yeah. a funny traditional school. Yes. But I loved it. There is something at the end of your time at Swanee called comps where you have to take a test based on everything you Mm -hmm. have learned in four years. So it kind of bombs your spring break plans and your Christmas plans because you literally have to go through Mm -hmm. every single thing you've done in four years and comp. And I did it in art history and history. And history, history right? Yeah. So you were a double major, so you had to do two I comps. did it twice. Theater is a little bit different, I feel like, than all the other majors. And honestly, I would have been a musical theater major. But, you know, with a school of 1,400 kids, you have limited ability to major in specific things. I probably would have done musical theater or communications. Those mm-hmm. would have been, but they didn't have those degrees. Yeah. So theater was the closest thing for me, which was really great because I had a lot of musical theater experience like mm-hmm. growing up and I did a lot of like summer programs and stuff in Kentucky. You know, I did as much as I could in Kentucky with musical theater. And for a while I thought I would sing country music or do Broadway because I like, you know, singing was my thing. But, you know, theater was the only thing you could do at Swanee. And it was very theatery theater yeah it's very Shakespeare Tennessee Williams with me and my southern accent it was just nothing <laughs> that I was used to at all so out of your comfort zone it was but it really pushed me I think for the first time in my life to do something that was so outside of the realm of what I was really good at mm-hmm. because growing up in Kentucky and then having a specific talent I of course I shined I mean I did I did all the things I was really good at yeah. and like I didn't ever join a basketball team because I wasn't going to be the star like yeah. why do that <laughs> but you know Swanee there were seven kids whatever that were theater majors in my grade and there were some people that were a lot better than me at theater mm-hmm. I wasn't good at that type of theater and it was a challenge for me but it was a great challenge for yeah. me Mm-hmm. I talk a lot in my book about this joke about confidence. Mm-hmm. People think that you are confident because you're good at something and you keep doing it. Mm-hmm. But I truly believe that you become confident when you're not good at something and you try it and you realize mm-hmm. you, you can do mm-hmm. it. Or you realize maybe you're not the best at it, but you come through it and you're still alive anyway. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like that might have been how theater was for you. Like yeah. you were in it and you were kind of like, maybe this isn't where I'm going to be. Mallory yes. Irvin from Kentucky with a <laughs> town named after me. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but that's interesting. So then you graduated from Swanee. Where did you go from there? Oh, gosh, that next few years was a very roundabout, but very awesome. And there have been so many times in my life, Lydia, where 
something fell into my lap that was so unexpected and I just rode it to a 10. Like I just went with it. I never was a person that was like, this is my life plan and this is the direction I'm going. Everybody get out of my way. I really like reinvented myself so many times and I went with the flow and it's been such an amazing way to live because there are so many opportunities that life hands you. Mm. And if you tell life like, no, actually, I'm going to do this. You know, sometimes it's like those opportunities are what shapes your whole entire life and like redirects the course to what is actually a better fit for you. So after college, uh, my dad randomly said to me one day, like in a car, I think you need to be Miss America. Or Miss Kentucky. And I was like, what? (laughs) I I don't do pageants. I'd never done. My sister did like Miss Union County Fair, Miss Corn Festival and stuff like that. But I was always the MC, and, you know, the one that was singing. I'm five feet tall. And (laughs) I was just like, what? So that started this this journey into pageants. That comment really was like that comment. It opened a door to something that I had never considered. Mm. So I remember that night that my dad said that to me. I Googled it. And I saw that 35% of the score was talent, which I had. 25% of the score which I was had. I'm sorry. Let's talk inter- about that. That's why I knew I liked you the <laughs> yeah. minute I met you, Mallory. You're like, talent, which I knew I had. 35% I check. Done. Yes, 35%. Oh, I love that comment. Now, swimsuit, um, I didn't have. I oh, had to work stop. at that. Oh, but well. then I did. And I won swimsuit. Like, I learned. I found my way. I found a way to win. So that night I was Googling and I was like, oh, I can do this. I think I can do this. Okay, like let's let's try this. I also saw that like once you won Miss Kentucky, you were a figurehead like in the state. You got yeah. to travel from one end of the state to the other, speaking to schools, and you got to speak on the House and the Senate floor, and you got to do these amazing events. And you know, I thought to myself, this would be amazing and something that I think I'd really like to do. So first year, I competed at Miss Kentucky. I had no idea what I was doing. You want to talk about confidence? I walked onto that stage like thinking that. I was going to do an awesome job in a velour catsuit with stirrups on the bottom. (laughs) And this was in 2006. It wasn't like 1987. And a green sequin, but with sequin fringe dripping off of it also. Two sets of shoulder pads. And this is the best part. (laughs) In the Miss Kentucky pageant, I sang Rocky Top, Tennessee. Tennessee Tennessee State Song. I was so blindly confident. I I didn't think I was going to win, I don't think. But I thought, this is going to be Right. People are gonna people are gonna walk away thinking this woman is <laughs> this, Miss America. This woman, where is she from? Oh my gosh! You know we've got to have her. So that was a really <laughs> great learning experience. I made it to the top ten. And what year was that? That was two thousand and seven. Oh okay. So the learning so I started, curve is bad. Yeah. yeah. I started competing my last year at Swanee, and it was so funny because I would like bring a crown home, and my friends would be like, "Can we wear this crown? <laughs> it's like an engagement ring." People are like, "Is this super? Sick? Can I wear this?" And Can I- I- Yes, you can wear the crown. Like, put the crown on your head. Okay, so that was my first year. Second year, I worked really hard. I listened to a lot of outside opinions of experts because mm-hmm. I was looking for my answers in that, which a lot of them are men who had never been in the pageant system, which looking back, it's like, that's so funny that we listened to those men who had never actually walked in a swimsuit or an evening gown on stage. They showed me how to walk. It's an you interesting know? commentary on life in general, I think, of the yes. people we listen to that have never done what we've done, and then we're all looking around like, Oh, you have all the answers to the keys uh-huh. of my life. Actually, that's not true. It's that's a very good point. And so that was the year that I like knew I was going to win. I felt like I, this is my year. Everything was perfect, but there was so much pressure. Mm. And I sang a song that I wasn't 100% sure of, but people said, this is the song you should sing, wore a dress, cut my hair, all of these things that everybody said, this is the way that you will win being you. And I didn't win. I was fourth runner up and I was pretty crushed. But I had one more year. So you age out at 26. Oh, wow. Okay. There are things I didn't know. So Uh I'm past my prime. I guess I will not. Mm -hmm. No, they raise the age to 28. You look about 28, but Um, you've got kids that are older. (laughs) So I know you're not 28. I don't believe anything you've just said, but thank you, Mallory. (laughs) So that last year I did it. I sang the song that I wanted to sing that they say you'll never win with that song because it's popular and it's been done before. And I did a lot of the things my way. I just said, I'm going to try it, which on a year where there was so much pressure, because I, Lydia, had to win this pageant. Mm. I had to win it. I wanted it so bad. I worked so hard. I took a whole year off of basically everything in my life to prepare for this pageant, interview coaching and swimsuit training and all of these things. And I took it really seriously. And... You know, I almost cracked. I almost like broke down before because there was so much. Just the weight of the world felt like it was on my shoulders. 
And, you know, looking back now, like having built businesses and written books and all this stuff, you look back on something that a lot of people think is really, you know, frivolous and silly like a pageant. I know it wasn't because I was in the system and it was a powerful thing in, in my life. And it, it really shaped me in, in so many ways. And there are so many things that I learned that year in particular about believing in myself mm-hmm. and about competing and like operating at a high level under intense I will die if I don't win this pressure. Yeah. That I think I still use a lot in my life today, honestly. And I won that year. And it was the most amazing like? year. I mean, of after my all life. that work. My brothers and sisters, they're like the one thing that I wish that you could have seen in your life that you didn't see was when they announced your name. Oh, I can't. The even crowd is that this big <laughs> they they were screaming, like jumping, screaming, like knocking each other over. You know, I got a oh. wild family and everyone's just so happy because oh. everybody just wanted it so bad. I wanted it so bad. Everybody yeah. wanted it so bad. You're like the star that they're putting. You're like Simba in the Lion King. Simba. They basically like lifted you up and everyone is supporting you. I can totally see this. I was Simba. The yeah. hopes of a small Kentucky town. <laughs> and here is Mallory and she has won it all. Oh, I love that it. that is awesome. That makes me laugh. That's so funny. <laughs> That was it. That was that moment. And it was an amazing year. You know, I went from my family home in Kentucky to college, which college you're surrounded by friends. And it's this young person's experience removed from home. But still, you know, you're kind of bubbly. Yeah. And this was my first year of life. This was my first, like, job outside of college was Mm -hmm. being Miss Kentucky and I, I got to speak on the you know floor to get bills passed on like, autism insurance reform, and I got to speak in the most impoverished like schools in my entire state because Kentucky, I mean Louisiana yeah. has parts of the state like oh, that too. It's, it's like you, you can't feel even like it's imagine. a third world country. Yeah, I absolutely. couldn't. I'd, I'd never seen that in yeah. my life because you know I lived in this little tiny bubble on one side of the state, and then I went to college, and it opened my eyes to the world. And it made me fall in love with people and all different kinds of people. And it made me, I was already, I was, I was a confident person always, mm-hmm. like since I was younger, but I was confident on my own. I didn't have a town behind me. I didn't mm-hmm. have all my friends around me. I would get up in the morning at 3.30 a.m. and work out for an hour and a half and then get myself ready and go to the first school. I had to be there at 7 a.m. by myself. Put my crown on, put my banner on, go in there, sing a song, speak to the kids, Q&A, out. Ten minutes, next school. You know, and that taught me a confidence in my ability of, like, what I could do. And discipline, too, right? Discipline. Yeah. That I was, as this single person, this young woman, like, I was powerful. I could do, I could do seven schools in a day. I could speak to the governor. I can be on the airplane with Coach Calipari and have a conversation with them. It it made me just feel good being a young woman on my own yeah and it was an amazing experience and i was fourth runner but miss america that year and it was awesome i i didn't i don't even think i really wanted to win miss america at the end i loved being miss kentucky so much yeah i was gonna ask that because you you know you described this moment of being miss kentucky with such a light and it clearly Mm -hmm. was such a huge thing and then miss america is the next thing but you grew up in Kentucky. At the end mm-hmm. of the day, I mean, Miss America must be an amazing stage, but even to get fourth in that is incredible. Yeah, it was great. You already I had mean, a crown. I already had a crown. Nobody <laughs> needs two crowns, you know <laughs> what I mean? Crown. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need another one, you know? And it was a really transitional time for Miss America, too. And you don't know, I mean, sometimes you really get lost in the shuffle, but I was not lost in the shuffle in Kentucky. Yeah. They treated me like a queen every single day. I would pull up to a UK football game or a basketball game with no ticket, and I'd just show them my crown and banner. They let me in the door. <laughs> oh back there, God. I would be back there with with, like the players, like I just, I could just do what I wanted in that state. It was like, really. Is there cool. a uh, like a sort of older statesman, Miss America or Miss Kentucky? Because I might want to run. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty good gig. I'm good at speaking. Run. I like meeting people. Oh, this and you're great. ten feet tall. Like you I would know. have been yeah. a shoe in, 100. percent I've got to learn you. how to baton twirl. By the way, that. Yeah, no. yeah. A lot of them do. They learn. They make up talents. They say, "I want to do Miss America because I'm, I'm ten feet tall and I'm really pretty." Yeah. So now let's think of a talent, which I think is really hard to do. Yeah, you got that 35 percent. You gotta check that box, Valerie. So, how did you end up from being Miss Kentucky? You go to Miss America. How did the Amazing Race happen? Because you so, went on it three times. Oh my gosh, yes, and that was another just 
incredible, amazing thing in my life that just fell into my lap. So I had a casting agent reach out. So on these, I think 40,000 couples apply for this show. So if you don't know what Amazing Race is, 12 teams of two race around the world for a million dollar prize. You do all these crazy things. You'll eat crazy things. You'll jump out of airplanes. You'll swim with sharks. You'll do just the craziest things. But you are immersed in the culture of whatever country you're in. So if you're playing the bicycle rim, you know, hit it with a stick game, you're playing it with the children in Ghana on a 110 degree day it it was the most incredible experience ever and I'd traveled abroad I did European studies like you did you know in college and we studied at Oxford and you know did all these things that all these little college kids do but you know this was just a different way to travel and it was really awesome too because I got to do it with my dad I know I can't so how did you pick your dad as a partner yeah that's so, so cool so they reached out and they were like would you like to apply for the amazing race and I said actually they reached out about survivor first and I, I said I've been oh starving to death God. for this pageant <laughs> yeah, for three like... months I will I can I will die 41 although days? you would have been well trained I would have thought you're like I just I had would've... to do the swimsuit pageant <laughs> I, I might as well just go for survivor I'm here anyway mm-hmm. so oh. I actually said no when they asked if I wanted to, to apply and well I think that a casting person had actually seen me on Miss America and it's a live telecast and I could clearly not contain my emotions if you watch videos of me on stage at Miss America I was like a wild cat and everyone else was like a <laughs> thoroughbred horse like I just when they would say my name I would be doing like a Michael Jackson back bend with my mouth open and just screaming I had no like <laughs> you know the other girls just really smile and beautifully wave and they would clutch their chests and they'd say thank you and I was just going like <laughs> <laughs> so I think that they probably said that's who we want because she clearly <laughs> cannot contain her emotion. We'll be sure to get our ratings up with yeah. this one. Uh-huh. <laughs> she will not hold back and cannot clearly cannot hold back. <laughs> and so um, they called back pretty quickly after that, and they said, "What about the Amazing Race?" And I said, "My dad has been watching that on our couch for ten years every Sunday night. He loves that show. Could I yeah. apply with my dad?" They said, sure. So you even if you get kind of cast, you still have to go through the application process. Yeah. Everybody that gets cast absolutely does not make the show. They just kind of find people that they want to throw into the pool. So that first season, we applied. And it was the year that I was arraigning Miss Kentucky to because Miss America is kind of in the middle of your year. So we ended up making it on the show. And it was hard. My dad is very, like, humble, salt of the earth kind of guy, like, mm-hmm. soft-spoken, doesn't talk a lot. And I like you <laughs> don't have a, probably an unspoken thought you know exactly. we like to talk a it lot all comes out exactly <laughs> it's a good thing and it's how so you get a podcast I it think. is exactly <laughs> how you raise a lot of money on stage you know exactly. what to say <laughs> so um we had to kind of find our balance i can remember like in an interview they were like if we can get 75 percent less of her and 75 percent more of you you're the perfect team you know because so, he wouldn't talk <laughs> yeah. you know and yeah. on a reality tv show especially one that's real this one's really real and authentic Mm -hmm. and they don't feed you lines they don't coax you into things it is very authentic so you really have to narrate and say what you're feeling what you're doing you know who how you feel about what that person just did or this challenge or your relationship with your partner and so we ended up making it on the show and it was I mean, to go from winning Miss Kentucky to runner-up in Miss America to the amazing race around the world. We made it close to the end of the show all within one year. And I was 25. I mean, it was, I mean, there was just nothing better. It was amazing. So we lost. Every time I lose something, every time I lost something, you know, I never lost anything growing up in this small town. You know, I was, like we said, I was the star. You were Simba. (laughs) I was was Simba. (laughs) And then... I got into my real life and I started losing things. I lost Miss Kentucky, lost it again, lost Miss America, lost The Amazing Race. Every time I would lose something, though, I was continuing to see a pattern. I got a better opportunity. Mm. I got a better. It didn't rock my world to where I just stepped away from everything. It it was just like, okay, what's next? I know this wasn't what I was meant to do because I I didn't make it to the end. And so as soon as we uh, got off that season of Amazing Race... They had always said they would never do another all-star season for some reason. So we were not even expecting to get a call. And before the season even aired, they called us and said, what would you, would you be interested in the all-star season? And I ran downstairs screaming. I said, I said to my dad, I was like, 
what would be the absolute best news we ever got in our entire life that we never in a million years thought we'd get in our entire life? And he said, Amazing Race is having an all-star season and we got cast. And I said, that's it. It must be something to be your dad. I mean, first of all, that entire sentence is so amazing. What is the best thing that could have ever happened to us in our And and we is used repeatedly, which is the greatest part of that. I'm glad your dad wasn't like publishers clearing houses outside with a $20 million check. No. That was the best thing that could happen in his whole life. So then you went back and did it again. Yeah. We almost won. And you almost won. We lost by a minute and 30 seconds in the very last leg. We got in a bad taxi. We're such, you know, Southerners at heart and like with our managers and everything. And it's a million dollar prize on the line and three teams race in the last leg. So we'd made it through all 12 countries. And it was us versus two of our good friends still today on the Harlem Globetrotters and then two of our other friends. And... We run. You run a hundred miles off this pl- airplane, and you run. Th- you break rules in the airport. I mean, you are just running flat out because you're in a race for a million dollars. Yeah. And so we got to the taxi line, and we jumped in this taxi. He had a GPS cell phone. Like you could, we we're getting ready to take off, and this lady opened the door and said, "I've been waiting for that taxi for thirty minutes." And we got out, got in the next taxi. Oh no. And this guy, he could hardly speak English. He didn't really, which is fine, but I did not speak the language that he spoke. And he had no idea how to get around Miami. Oh, Didn't have no. a smartphone. Oh, no. And we made up hours and hours with how fast we did the challenges. But like, you know, it. We, we, lost, we lost by a minute and 30 seconds. We would have won by probably two hours, had everything oh. gone as perfectly as it did. But, you know, that was one of the moments now looking back. Had we won the amazing race and had we had I had half a million dollars at my disposal at 25 years old where I was on the top of the world, but kind of starting to feel daunting pressure Mm. um, of what I was going to do next and starting to question things. And I'd also very, very slowly started a dependence on prescription medication, which is also part of my story. And if I'd won The Amazing Race, I don't think I'd be here today. I don't think I would be alive today. I yeah. really don't. So, so many of those things that I thought that I wanted so badly in my life, I think they saved my life so yeah. many times. They either offered me a better opportunity or they changed the direction of my life in, in an amazing way. And that's so. where I started off at the beginning of this podcast because that's where I opened the book. Yeah. And in the the first part of the book, the very first chapter, you talk about having your hair extensions cut mm-hmm. out because you've been admitted mm-hmm. to a drug facility, mm-hmm. to a rehab facility. Mm-hmm. So in these parallel universes where you are going sky high, you're also having an issue, a personal issue, a very personal issue. Yeah. So talk to me about that. And also talk to me about telling that story. Yeah. Because that takes strength mm-hmm. and courage, which obviously you have in spades, but it's public. It's a very public yeah. life that you've lived up until this mm-hmm. point. And it's also, it's very easy to be confident in yourself when you are showing the shiny pieces you know when everybody knew that i'd done miss america and that i had all of these accolades of course you can be confident but i was really nervous to put that part of my story out there because i didn't know if i i sometimes didn't know if i was confident with that part of my story yeah and i didn't know how it would be received there were members of my family that didn't even know that it was not public knowledge Mm -hmm. and so it was kind of a slow burn with developing this and it was always prescription medication that a doctor Mm -hmm. was prescribing me to focus or fall asleep Never things that I thought would get out of hand until they did get out of hand. And then you just don't recognize yourself anymore. And then it becomes, it controls your life. And then it steals your spirit. I always had this spirit that I just felt, I felt this hunger and this zest for life. And I loved living like every day. And it took it from me. I woke up in the morning and I just didn't even care if I woke up. And you know, to come from doing all those amazing things to feeling like that, like that's what drugs and alcohol, I think if you grow dependent on them can take from you, it just yeah. takes your will to live uh, and so much more. And so it was a slow burn. You know, it wasn't really an issue like while I was Miss Kentucky or anything, but that's when they started prescribing those medications to me that I didn't need. Yeah. And it just increased and increased and increased over a few years. Your body gets used to it, right? Yes. Is that what happens? Exactly. Yeah. And anybody would, you know, if I told them I needed more, it was a prescription medication that I'd been prescribed by another doctor. Of course, they're like, okay, I'm sure this is legit because so-and-so gave it to you. So it got to a point, though, where I, I didn't recognize myself. I didn't feel like myself. I felt like just like a shell of a person. And I lived in Nashville at the time. My parents lived in Kentucky. No one was really around me that the end when it got really, really bad. 
And this is after the the Amazing Race. So yes, this is, this like, is after. Okay. But I was growing at Appendance like during then, but it was really after that. Mm-hmm. And this also combined with everything had just gone so right for me in my life. Everyone was so proud of me. And I honestly, so many times in my life during this, especially that last year, I I knew that there was something really wrong. And I knew I probably would not live if I continued to take this medication at this level. I knew like I was going to die. And I even had a doctor tell me, he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you're doing. But, you know, based on the things that he had just checked my vitals and everything, he's like, you're going to die if you continue it. Oh, gosh. And I walked out of that doctor's appointment and I thought, you know, I've lived an incredible life and I will probably go to the grave with this because I, no one can know. And God, shame is such an amazing shame thing. Shame is such isn't an it? amazing thing. It really hides it all. It does. And like how can you how can you go from from that to that? How can you go from such a high and the high I mean that the, I've reached the, all my mountaintops at 25 years old though yeah. those were so big for this tiny small town girl like me and there was so much joy but that pressure that like that pressure you know those it, it just I crumbled beneath it yeah and um I it I am so grateful though that I ended up where I ended up because it shifted my life once again in another direction and it taught me you know, to really embrace adversity. Mm -hmm. Adversity wasn't a part of my early life. And then when it became a part of my life, I just, I I realized there was just such a deeper way to live. Mm -hmm. And the only way to access that is to go just head on through these challenges and things that as adults now we know are just part of life. Yeah. And I thought that I'd go for 30 days and, you know, I was like the shiny one to go into the You're treatment like, I'm facility. Check that box. And, and I like, thought, <laughs> okay, great. And then I'll write a book about it. And yeah. this will be great. This will <laughs> give me a little street cred, you know. Yeah. It'll be great. Great storyline here. Uh, they um, kept me for five and a half months because, and I mean, th- there were people on hard street drugs leaving before me. Yeah. Because I had so much like perfectionism and so much just ingrained in me that I'd built and built and built being this mm. confident person that, you know, was doing all these things and achieving my goals. That was just as detrimental to me and my life and fueled addiction mm. as much as some of these people's stories that they were telling that looked so vastly different than my own. And, Honestly, it was an amazing experience, like being in this treatment facility and the things that I learned and the world that I was exposed to. Mm -hmm. And I came out and everybody was really afraid for me to enter into any kind of like public sphere. Yeah, I was wondering because the spotlight is obviously something that you're good at and Mm -hmm. something that you crave. And with that, a lot of times that sort of party scene is part of that as well, Mm -hmm. right? In many ways. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people thought, or my parents, because a lot of people didn't know, my parents thought that that was what kind of did me in, the Mm. pressure of that. And like, they were really worried for me to go back into, into that in any way. And I can remember my mom saying, you should just like work at a makeup counter at Nordstrom, which is great for some people. But I said, I'm not, I don't want to work at a makeup counter. Yeah. I want to do something different. I was, I, I knew that, what was in me that caused me to get to that point was not there anymore. Yeah. And I knew that I was strong against this and I, I was ready to like take on a whole new chapter and ready for that I next mountain yeah, climb, ready I to get to the top again. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I was on shaky ground. I felt like I was on like more authentic ground and more, I felt like a different type of person. Mm-hmm. And so I got out of that treatment facility in maybe, oh gosh, I can't even remember the years. 2014, uh, maybe 2013, 2014. I can't remember. And it's been almost 10 years ago. Mm. And Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. That's an amazing Thank milestone. You. Thank you. And um, everybody was starting blogs then. And I said, I'm going to start a blog. So I would start taking pictures in my outfits and doing makeup, you know, tutorials. And then I started a YouTube channel because it kind of started gaining traction. And then mm. Instagram wasn't really out, I don't think, in the beginning, or maybe it was brand new. So I got an Instagram, and I started doing this, like, online marketing thing, which was kind of in my wheelhouse because I was a person that was on a regular stage. This felt like a stage, another stage. And it was one thing after another, and then I did the podcast, and then I did the books, and then I did the merch line. And, you know, now my husband owned a successful valet company, and a couple years into it, he— 
he was like, this is really going somewhere. I'll come over and work for you. I'll edit your YouTube videos. And this was a totally different realm. I had to Google how to start a YouTube video. Yeah. I had to Google how to start a blog. I didn't know how to pose in fashion. Even though I'd done Miss America, it was just a different world for me. And yeah. I, I just, I loved it. And I knew I could do it. And, you know, I was actually talking to Kyle on the way over here. And he was asking me what this podcast was about. And he, he and I was like, it's about confidence. And that's Lydia's thing. And she's just, claim your confidence and this stuff. And I said, you know, the thing with confidence in me is when I was in a room that I knew I wasn't the best at what I was doing in a room, I never felt intimidated by the people that were better than me. I always watched them in awe and I studied them. And I thought, always naturally thought, that is so awesome that I want to talk to that person that is so amazing, I'll do it next. Yeah, I always thought that. And I always hate to hear when people are in a room with people that are doing the thing that they want to do 10 times better than them. Like I was always in those rooms and they shrink yeah. under that. Yeah. And they feel less than. And competitive and, and jealous. Competitive yeah. And like they have to find a way to like cut them out mm -hmm. because there was just, I felt like there was all the room in the world in every space. And I did it in every single space that I've done as an entrepreneur, lifestyle entrepreneur. I, I didn't know what I was doing as in YouTube videos, in doing blogs, posing like I was a fashion person. I didn't know what I was doing. Makeup tutorials. I was not a trained makeup artist. I mean, I just owned it. Podcast, writing a book, doing a merchandise line and designing fashion things. I felt like there was room. I still feel like there's room. Because if, at the end of the day, and I love saying this to people who are so concerned with failure, it's not failure because you're the only person who knows what success looks like in your own life. Yeah. You know, like yes. what is success for any of us? Like you get to define success in yes. your life. You get to decide what that looks mm -hmm. like. And so if something doesn't work out, as you've shown 15 times in your own life, there's an evolution. You know, yes. I love what you said at the beginning about when you're talking about how things that didn't work out for you, ultimately something better came as a result of mm -hmm. it. And that the reason it did is because it showed you something else. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that that's a, a winning mindset in life. Yes. You know, you have to choose to look at opportunities like that and realize that you're going to have more opportunities mm -hmm. and not let those things close you down and deflate yes. you. Because if you yeah. stop going, nothing ever happens for you. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that a lot of people write off things like all of the things that we say, you know, and the perspective talk and that you have to be positive and the next door will open and they, and, you know, they write it off as like a bumper sticker. Yeah. And I'm like, it is said over and over and over, not because it's cliche and just some words, but because that's the actual fact of the matter. Absolutely. That is Absolutely. the actual fact of the matter. I agree. And you and I have a very similar perspective, and yeah. I think that's why we've probably ended up in very different realms, but, you know, a similar, you know, climb, I guess. But I love the title of your first book. Like, I just think if you think that you are the most powerful person in the room— you are the yeah. most powerful person in the room. There's nothing more powerful than individual confidence. No, I completely agree. Yes. And you know what's funny? The most powerful woman in the room is you, the first book. People mm -hmm. literally say to me, I saw it across the room at Target, and I had to have it. Mm -hmm. Like, I was drawn, drawn to this book. To it. Like, it was me on the inside. And I believe that that's the confidence is at the core. That yeah. if you have it on the inside, however you get it, if it's the school of hard knocks, maybe you're born with it, maybe you have it, you mm -hmm. lose it over time. But if you believe it, mm -hmm. there really is nothing you cannot try yeah. in this life. And that's a really exciting, fulfilling life. Yes. And that yes. really takes us to your book title, mm -hmm. Living Fully. Mm -hmm. So tell me all about that platform and what you've built there. Yeah, so Living Fully was something that was born of, I'd done about three or four things. I had the blog, I had the YouTube channel, I had the kind of social media following. And I thought, you know, what do I stand for? Mm -hmm. What What is it that I feel like if I had to encompass my whole quote unquote brand, because that's what, you know, people are able to have an online marketing platform now and create a full-blown, very, very successful brand. Yeah. It's, it's an awesome thing. And I kind of was going through some branding stuff for the first time in my life. And I wrote down like everything that I, that I felt mm. about life, about what I wanted my audience to feel when they came to visit me, about what I, what product or what you know, video or whatever it was that I was putting out, what I wanted people to feel. And so living live fully came to the top, which mm. eventually became living fully. And when I wrote the book, so everything was called living fully. Then I did the podcast living fully. And like, it's just living fully, live fully. <laughs> like, it is just my thing. Like, it is really how I feel about life. And so 
I was like seven or eight years sober when I decided to come out with this part of my story because I'd amassed a big following online Mm -hmm. and people were watching my life on the other side of this thing that no one knew about. Were you scared someone was going to find out? Because that's what I always wonder. When you no. have something like that, you weren't scared. You were I kind wasn't. Of over uh, it. Uh, um, maybe and that was like naive of me not to be scared, but you can kind of just ignore that one person, I yeah. feel like. And, yeah. and I didn't feel like I was that big of a name to where people would care like that much. So it's actually honestly very odd that no one found out because mm. these facilities, especially if you're there for almost six months, like a lot of people come in and out of those things. Mm -hmm. And the fact that nobody really found found out was interesting. It was a God thing, because I think that I was meant to put it in this book and and share the living play message. Tell your narrative, tell your own story. And so when we were meeting with publishers, I had the option of doing really whatever type of book I wanted to do first. At the end of the day, I was very grateful. I had a great literary agent, and I had an offer on the table for a lifestyle book first. And then one was a kind of children's book, and then one was kind of, they were really open to several of our concepts. And I said, I've got to tell this story. This is the, I have to tell this story because I have spent years of getting the same message over and over in my DMs of, I wish I could wake up and feel in my life like you seem to feel when you Mm -hmm. show up on Instagram stories or YouTube, whatever it was. And I would always go back to those people and send them a message and say, oh, but I've, you know, went through this thing and I choose to live this way every day. And I just kept getting those messages over and over. I wish that I, I wish I would. And I was like, I've got to tell the story. Yeah. They don't know. And this is going to be such a shock to them. And I don't ever want to feel like people like people write off happiness as automatic because mm. I don't believe that happiness and joy and living fully and fulfillment is just an automatic. You're born that way. Like totally you have black agree. hair or blonde hair. Yeah. I'm not born with blonde hair, but if I were born with blonde hair. <laughs> Neither am I, Mallory. Yeah. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> so, You're not the only one. <laughs> It's uh, it's something that is, is worked toward, worked towards and fostered and mm. chosen. Yeah. Every single day, every day I wake up and I choose to live fully. Mm. Every single day, I, I, I assess my life and I think like, what are the things in my life that need to change to like bring me up to this way I want to live? This is it. Yeah. This is all the life that I have, and I want to do it so big and so bright and so just bigger and bigger and bigger and but I choose it every day so I had to write it in the book Mm -hmm. and I opened the book with that story where they're taking out my hair extensions and since this is on confidence because that's one of the moments because you say it in your book too like are you tired of hearing the shiny the bright shiny story like here comes you done here's the (laughs) u-turn here's the (laughs) u-turn because there was the bright shiny part of my story but man was there a u-turn yeah and I'd been in treatment for about 30 days. They'd sent me across the street to the extended care. And, you know, here I am just thinking, oh, oh let's just get this done with because I got to get on with my life. But I started realizing that I had more work to do and all this stuff. And they really knew what they were doing with me because one day they told me I was doing a really great job. So they were going to let me have a hair appointment off site. This is not like you get to get in your car with your cell phone and go to the hair appointment. This is you get in the facility van with the sliding door with no cell phone and like you have to sign out and you have to and you have two hours and it's supervised all these things. Like I'm going to run away, you know, <laughs> or whatever. People did that. So, yeah, you know, I didn't. <laughs> I wanted that was to, probably I something they learned by experience, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah. So I went to this hair appointment and by the time I was, you know, a, a month or a month and a half in, my eyelashes had started falling off. My hair extensions, which I'd had for 10 years, these long blonde hair extensions, I'd never gone one day without them. They had started um, falling out of my hair and melting. And like there were these big chunks of matted up hair. And obviously they're not going to let me go in there and get a full head of hair extensions. That's not the kind of thing they let you do in rehab. But they were going <laughs> to let me have an appointment where I could get them taken out, get my hair highlighted. Because like I said, I'm not a natural blonde. So I got there not thinking like much of taking my hair out. And she turned my chair around so I wasn't facing the mirror. And it took about an hour, an hour and a half to take them out. And she would take them out and she would put them on this little silver tray and take one out, unstick them, put on the tray, comb the glue out of your hair. And when she turned me around to face the mirror, the first time seeing myself with all of this hair out, I had, for the only time in my life I can say I had an out-of-body experience. I had a full out-of-body experience. And it was like, my life flashed before my eyes and something so viscerally shifted in me where I felt like the person that I was had been just like stripped of me. Like I I felt 
ugly and I felt just gross and I felt so foreign to myself. I didn't recognize. I looked like a, I felt like I looked like a monster when mm-hmm. I was looking at myself in the mirror. And to tell this story to people, and I opened this book up and I, I just thought to myself, you know, will people ever really realize like how deep this moment was? This was one of the most groundbreaking moments in my life. Yeah. When they took a blonde hair extension out of my hair, Lydia, looking back on I mean, people will maybe think that that is just so funny that that was really the no. straw that broke the camel's back. But for me, my confidence what I, and my who I was Your was identity. so— My identity was wrapped up in this person that I'd been my whole life. Yeah. The one that was on the stage, the one that was the MC, the one that yeah. was singing the songs Beautiful. The one with the crown. And, yeah, of course. The crown, yes. of course. Yes. Yeah. When I walked into the room, I didn't even have to introduce myself and tell you my accolades. It I was on the banner. I a crown yeah. and a banner. <laughs> yeah. It was I all mean, there. Yeah. It was all so good, but at the same time, for me and a person that clung to those things for dear life, it— unraveled me at yeah. the same time yeah and in that moment when they took that hair out that was the moment it just broke open for me yeah and i went back to the facility and that was the only time that i almost left i called my parents and i was like they don't know what they're doing i'd or i'd gained 35 pounds in like six weeks too i just felt like so foreign to myself yeah but it was the best work that I ever did in my life because I let go of all those things. I let go of this ide- being so attached to my identity. I didn't even know I was that attached until yeah. I had a nervous breakdown in the hair salon. And it was pivotal and it was groundbreaking. And it was something still that informs so many of the decisions that I make today, the way that I parent my kids. The way, you know, I've got a daughter now. Mm-hmm. The things that I think about now, I am cognizant always of don't get attached to this persona. Don't get attached to these followers. Don't get attached to this money that you'll make on this brand deal. Don't get attached to being in the center of Rockefeller Plaza and doing a podcast with Lydia Finette. I, I have to remember always who I am at the core of all of it. And what an amazing experience going into a treatment facility was because it afforded me the opportunity to be introduced to myself without all that stuff. Yeah. And I either would have probably died in the process of my drug addiction, or I never would have had the opportunity to get to that. And that's why it was one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me in my whole life. And I'm saying that even over the Miss America stage and reality TV and all the amazing things I've been able to do, being in a treatment center for five and a half months was one of the most, was probably the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. You know, there's this great book that my sister quoted to me once about an adventurer who had gone onto a ship and it had been rocking all night and he was with this group of people and they thought the ship was going to capsize and they'd been sick all night and they were just in hell. They'd like strapped themselves to the boat and they woke up the next morning and the storm had passed and it was crystal clear water Mm -hmm. and it was ice cold, like ice cold water. And they stripped off their clothes and they jumped into this ice water. And he says in the book, you only know the ones because you know the tens in Mm -hmm. life. And I think Mm -hmm. about moments like that and what you've described. And I know that because you shared your one, there are so many people who not only who are listening now, but who read your book Mm -hmm. and feel renewed and rejuvenated understanding that someone who brings such life and joy to the world can also have those moments of low and has been gracious enough to share them. Yes. yes. So thank you, Mallory, for being here. Thank you Mm -hmm. for living fully. And I want to ask our followers, I always end with one question. How are you living fully today? Uh, And actually, I'll ask you that, Mallory. How have you lived fully today? And then I want you to tell us all about what we can expect next. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing me onto your platform. This was so fun. I know. I feel like if you would like to come back anytime, feel (laughs) free. I'll come back anytime. I know where you are now. We'll just put the microphones on. (laughs) I'm living fully now in a season where I have three young children, five, three, and one. And I'm growing new businesses How I'm living fully now is continuing to ensure that the opportunities in my business world and life don't outweigh this very short season Mm -hmm. of having young children. So there are days that I block out a lot of time because I can build businesses in forever. I my kids will not be young forever. And that is what a full life looks like. To, to me right now yeah. and gratitude is so cliche but my husband and I wake up in the morning in our home and we feel like it's like a fairy tale so we feel I mean we're because we went through it you know he was with me in active addiction yeah and he you know 
from going from that and like fighting for my life and then coming up and building a business and we just we can't believe it like it was hard fought but it is just so it's so awesome now just this life with young kids and so living fully now is like continuing to just like remember what a gift it is like the way that our life is now and balance um that is living fully and then you can find me anyway i'm literally everywhere on the internet that's not sketchy (laughs) that's not (laughs) sketchy i'm gonna borrow that line from now on (laughs) tell my parents that instagram and and you know literally everywhere Everywhere. but instagram is where i am the most yeah and in stories you know we really show the behind the scenes of our life i admire all those instagram influencers and stuff who can get up and really look put together and have like a set of eyelashes on in the morning yeah. it is not what you're going to see on my page it is very real <laughs> but that's see good it. because it, it is, is like, real and everybody yeah, needs to see that it's and great know it. you know i was polished for years and you with the crown and banner i ain't got the crown and banner on all the story <laughs> i love it yeah, i love so. the recent visit to the farm too well mallory yes. thank you so much thank for coming you. to newsstand studios thank you to for rockefeller center for hosting this podcast it's always such a joy and a pleasure to be here especially in a beautiful summer day. Thank you to Joe for making us sound wonderful and for always being a great laugh track in the background. But Mallory, stop by anytime. And to our listeners, we will be here next Tuesday. Thank you again for listening to Claim Your Confidence. I'm Lydia Finette, and I'll see you next week.